Tonight, the cost of catastrophe. New details on the mission to find the ill-fated Titan tourist sub. The price to taxpayers for Canada's role in the difficult search. As the American owners suspend all operations. Threads versus Twitter. I feel like Instagram is really taking over. I just like Twitter better. The tens of millions giving their first impressions of Meta's new app. Plus, a Hollywood grievance against Canadian gridlock. What's up with the traffic in Toronto? I don't know. Have they figured this out? Action star Tom Cruise takes a jab <laughs> at Toronto. I don't accept that. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. We are getting a first look tonight at the financial impact when adventure travel goes horribly wrong. New numbers today reveal the multinational search and rescue effort after the Titan disaster cost millions to Canada alone. The tally comes on the same day Titan's owner, OceanGate, said it was suspending all exploration and commercial operations. Its submersible imploded near the Titanic wreckage site last month, killing all five people on board. The trip costing more than $300,000 Canadian per traveler. CTV's Judy Trin joins me now with the preliminary tab. And Judy, what does it show? Omar, initial estimates by the Department of National Defense put the cost to taxpayers at nearly $3 million. But that only includes the bill for one military plane. It doesn't include the ships that were also involved. A long-range aurora like this one took off from Nova Scotia to join the search for the Titan and its passengers on June 18th. The pilots conducted a visual search for three and a half days. Their mission also included dropping sonic buoys into the Atlantic Ocean to detect sounds from the submersible. It cost nearly $30,000 an hour to operate the plane. The Aurora flew for 82.5 hours during its search. The pilots also dropped 341 sono buoys. Each buoy cost $1,300. Add that up and it comes to $2.9 million. Four Canadian ships also participated in the search, including the Navy vessel HMCS Glace Bay and three Coast Guard ships. Those costs to the Canadian taxpayers have yet to be factored in. The Canadian government considered this a humanitarian mission. Under international maritime law, nation states have an obligation to help rescue people who are in distress at sea. Omar. All right, Judy, thanks for this tonight. And we've got a detailed breakdown of the financial tally of the Titan search on our website. The full investigation by Daniel Otis is at ctvnews.ca. The cost of doing business in the world of electric car batteries is being debated tonight after the price to taxpayers was revealed to keep one project going. A deal between the federal and Ontario governments and automaker Stellantis will see the company get up to $15 billion for a plant in Windsor. As CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports, with so much competition for these jobs, it's tough to drive a hard bargain. Work resumed on this massive electric vehicle battery plant in Windsor after Stellantis shut down construction nearly two months ago. The auto manufacturing giant threatened to move it to the United States unless Canada matched massive green subsidies on offer from Washington. There is a window of opportunity. It's open now but it's going to close. The world's big companies are making their investment decisions right now. Over the next decade, 15 billion taxpayer dollars in performance incentives are available for Stellantis and project partner LG Energy Solution. The federal and provincial funding is contingent on how many batteries are produced and sold. Basically, it's uh, tax credits so if they don't make batteries, they don't get the tax credits. The battery plant in Windsor is expected to create 2,500 jobs and thousands of others along the supply chain. The spin-off of values on a battery plant are probably two or three jobs to one. As part of the deal, Ontario will provide a third of the funding to Stellantis and a third of the $13 billion Volkswagen battery deal for a factory in St. Thomas. While the federal government picks up the rest, saying the increased financial commitment is to compete with the U.S. I think both countries are making a mistake. 
you know, paying so much. The government says the expense will turn Canada into a global EV player while leveraging vast reserves of critical minerals. The minerals itself are there. Uh, extracting and transporting them down here uh, is uh, not at all a, a done deal. Today, the Ontario government expressed interest in making more deals with automakers looking to go electric, Omar. But Ottawa has said its budget can only stretch so far. All right, Kevin Gallagher in Ottawa tonight. Kevin, thanks. There is little headway on a deal to end the labour dispute at Canada's largest seaports tonight. CTV's BC Bureau Chief Melanie Nagy on the financial hit businesses are already feeling. Wine from South Africa, New Zealand and Australia are some of the products caught in the middle of BC's ongoing and costly port strike. It's difficult in the sense that it disrupts cash flow. Pete Marshall is an independent wine importer who currently has product on a cargo ship destined for Vancouver. If the strike continues for another week, then it won't be unloaded and it won't go to my warehouse. If not in the warehouse, he can't sell it to Canadians. It's a small order that's out there right now, but it still represents about $10,000 um, in raw cost. The labour dispute between port workers and their employer is costing Canada's economy up to a billion daily. With the strike now in its sixth day, that's about $6 billion so far. Our economy depends on, on exports so much and our manufacturing sector depends on imports you know this is something that just can't continue manufacturing machinery automotive and aerospace all sectors relying on bc's ports to move supplies it's going to impact the bottom line of our businesses in a big way Canada's multi-billion dollar agriculture industry is also starting to feel the impact, particularly with wheat, canola and port exports. We're going to have a, a bottleneck situation where we're going to have a backlog of products. As for consumers, analysts say the supply chain disruption might mean longer waits for things like vehicles. As for goods on store shelves like international wines, it's unlikely prices will spike, but there could be shortages. Because we can't replenish our supply of international products, if this goes on for several weeks, we may start to see some shortages. Since the strike started, negotiations have been rocky with little movement on issues like pay increase. Both sides are accusing the other of being unreasonable. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. The sweltering heat across much of the country is part of a global trend where the planet hit a record high temperature this week and stayed there. CTV's Heather Butts on the impact of the searing heat in this country and the areas finally catching a break with cooler weather. Some much needed rain providing relief tonight, breaking up the heat and humidity that has been smothering millions across Ontario and Quebec for days. I can't sleep in my uh, bedroom, it's way too hot, it's upstairs, so I just was sleeping in my basement. When factoring in the humidity, Toronto felt just as hot today as it was in Dubai tough for those working outside. Cases of water with cool ice in the cooler, you know, wet our, wet our heads down, wear hats. Heat warnings remain in place in parts of the country. Other than our first day, uh, I don't think we've had over 200 people in the pool. Right now we're sitting around 300 in the pool. Communities in Newfoundland and BC hitting record-breaking temperatures Wednesday. It's really just a push of uh, warmer, uh, humid air from the south of the United States that's allowed for us to have these temperatures in the near term. That deadly heat wave now baking every corner of the U.S. I have asthma, so the air quality is really hard on my lungs. And then with the heat on top, it's like having a meltdown all in one. Scorching conditions leading to the hottest day on Earth this week. The global average temperature breaking a record Monday, then climbing even higher Tuesday and remain there Wednesday. Every year we're breaking new records. It's a little scary to hear it, kind of knowing the threats that type of heat imposes on, on communities. As climate change makes heat waves more common, health experts are urging people to be aware of illnesses like heat stroke. And that is when you start having confusion, uh, delirium as we call it, um, as well as um, loss of consciousness um, and more severe brain injury. Um, as a result of the effects of heat. The next couple days we'll see a return to more normal conditions for Ontario and southern Quebec, but across Canada the forecast is calling for temperatures that are higher than usual for the next two months. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto.
Well, many rely on air conditioners to cool down during these extended heat waves, but that wasn't an option for roughly 200,000 people without power in Montreal, where it felt like 40 degrees with the humidity. No word on the cause, but Hydro-Quebec says there was an automatic mechanism that was triggered, and that means restoration is usually faster. A dire wildfire forecast tonight from the federal government. Drought conditions, when coupled with above normal temperatures across most of the country, means that the risk of fire activity is going to remain very high throughout the majority of the summer. This is already the worst fire season in Canadian history, scorching more than 88,000 square kilometres so far. Canada marked a somber anniversary today, commemorating the country's deadliest rail crash in the small town of Lac Mégantic, Quebec, exactly a decade ago. CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin is there tonight as the community comes together to remember. The bells of St. Agnes tolled 47 times for 47 lives lost. A solemn moment in front of the church spared by the runaway train a decade ago when so much was not. I knew 20 of the people who died that day, she says. The town's former mayor, Colette Roy-Laroche, attended ceremonies today. She was known as the Granite Lady for her strength when the train wrecked her town. I'm emotional now, she says. I'm letting the feelings I buried for a decade come to the surface so I can heal. Center stage during the church service, the faces of those killed and the parents and children they left behind. Isabelle Boulanger lost her 19-year-old son, Frédéric. The very last words he told me is, I love you, Mom. The train's crossings here were cancelled for the anniversary. Some have long called for that to be permanent. Despite new rules and more inspections after the crash, the number of runaway train incidents in Canada peaked at 78 in 2019. And several here have been pushing for a rail bypass around Lac Mégantic. But opposition from landowners and environmental concerns have delayed the project for too long, said Prime Minister Justin Trudeau today, vowing construction will start in the fall despite those concerns. The need to uh, move forward with more healing uh, and a better future is a uh, top of mind for me. And despite divisions, the community came together for a silent march. At 1.14 a.m., the moment a decade ago, the train from hell, as they say here, ripped through the heart of town. Michelle Dubé lost her niece, Marie-France Boulet. It's a, a big piece from my heart. It went away. And in one pew during the church service, a powerful image of what a decade has brought. A father who lost his daughter sitting next to a railway controller from MMA, the company that owned the runaway train. We're a very close friend now. The mayor here says Lake Megantic is much more than this tragedy, that 10 years on, it's a resilient town intent on rebuilding and continuing to heal. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Lac Megantic, Quebec. Ukrainian officials say at least seven people were killed in a Russian missile strike on the western city of Lviv, more than 500 kilometers away from the front lines. Ukraine's military says it shot down most of the missiles destined for the city, deemed a safe haven for those fleeing the war. Local authorities call it the worst attack on Lviv since the invasion began. North of the border, the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, claims Wagner mercenary leader Evgeny Prigozhin is in Russia, despite a deal with the Kremlin to transfer him to Belarus following his short-lived mutiny on Moscow last month. Time for a break, but when we come back... It's not treating the symptoms, it slowed down the decline. Americans gain wider access to a breakthrough Alzheimer's drug. Plus, the debut of Threads and the threat to Twitter. Alberta's opioid crisis has reached a new peak. The province recording the highest number of emergency calls it's ever had in a single week. Almost 340 people called 911 to report overdoses, surpassing the previous record from the week before. The first drug to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease was granted full approval by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. It's not a cure, but a clinical trial showed Lakembi slowed cognitive decline by 27% over an 18-month period compared to those who took a placebo.
I really cannot overstate how important today is. This is really a game changer for our field. There are concerns the drug costs more than $26,000 U.S. a year, but Medicare will cover the price if doctors provide patient data. And there are side effects, brain swelling and bleeds. The drug is still awaiting approval from Health Canada. A legal battle is brewing between social media giants with Meta's newly launched Threads threatening Elon Musk's Twitter, where it was trending. The platform already has tens of millions of users, but as CTV's John Venavelli rao reports, it also has its own pitfalls. All right, hey everyone, big news today. Uh, we are launching Threads. Mark Zuckerberg was quick to boast about the launch of his Twitter rival, saying in less than a day, more than 30 million users had already signed up. Uh, the people who have tried it out so far, the reactions have been really great. But Elon Musk's Twitter quickly firing back, threatening to sue, accusing Zuckerberg's meta of hiring ex-Twitter employees to build its competing Threads app. A lawyer for Twitter alleging systematic, willful and unlawful misappropriation of Twitter's trade secrets to develop a copycat. Meta denies the allegations. Look, like you can repost, it looks just like Twitter, bro. Many have dubbed Threads a Twitter clone. You can write short posts with a 500 character limit and post videos up to five minutes long. Instagram's two billion users can easily sign up using their account. Celebrities like Oprah Winfrey, J-Lo, and Kim Kardashian have already done so, along with Major League Basketball and Baseball. From what I've seen, there's been influencers, there's been publishers, news agencies, just about everyone is getting on the thread bandwagon. Guys, you gotta hop on threads. Some Twitter users have been unhappy with the way Musk's been running Twitter, recently imposing temporary limits on how many posts users can read. I think anything can basically rival Twitter nowadays. But some point out Zuckerberg's meta has been embroiled in controversies over its data collection policies and privacy. We're in a bit of a honeymoon period, so uh, there are no annoying ads yet. There are no bots yet. And some users surprised to discover they could only delete their new Threads account if they deleted Instagram. You guys, what did we just do? And while Zuckerberg and Musk have mused about fighting each other in a mixed martial arts cage match, the battle that really matters has just begun. John Venavelli Rouse, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead, cruising through congestion. A Hollywood actor's hot take on Toronto traffic. Tom Cruise was once told he couldn't handle the truth, but as it turns out, what he really can't handle is Toronto traffic. The Hollywood star made the surprising revelation as he was promoting his new film. CTV's Natalie Johnson has the details. He is known for his death-defying stunts, but Hollywood heavyweight Tom Cruise says the real Mission Impossible is navigating Toronto traffic. I've been in that traffic, all right? I've made movies in Toronto and I've visited Toronto. I have friends in Toronto. Yeah. What's up with the traffic in Toronto? I don't know. Have they figured this out? Cruz was sitting down with E-Talk's Sonia Mangat ahead of the release of his summer blockbuster Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1. It's been years since Cruz shot a movie here, and GTA drivers say the gridlock's worse than it was. It's definitely out of control. It's too much. Downtown, I try to avoid as much as possible. All the roads are pretty old, right? It's not, it's not like, you know, brand new. <laughs> you know, what Tom Cruise says is always right, right? <laughs> Mayor-elect Olivia Chow said today she believes better public transportation to get cars off the road and better coordination of road work and construction would go a long way to unlocking gridlock. Of course, if there are other alternate ways to travel, whether it is walking, cycling, mopeds, any number of different mode of transportation that would also go a long way in making Mr. Tom Cruise happy. As for Cruise, he's not sure part two of his movie should involve a Toronto traffic stunt. I have done that. Okay, I have driven <laughs> without, in Toronto. Without road rage for okay, two hours. Yes, do, now, do you accept that challenge? I, you know what? I have done that challenge. <laughs> a challenge he's not sure he wants to take on again. Toronto's Mayor Lack, who officially takes office next week, is inviting Cruz to come back to this city in a few months' time, hoping she can get traffic moving in time for the film festival. Natalie Johnson, CTV News, Toronto. And they're dusting off the white hats in Calgary tonight ahead of the city's stampede, which kicks off tomorrow. 
But this morning's first flip pancake breakfast gave visitors an early taste of the celebrations. The 10 day stampede is expected to attract more than a million people and bring in more than half a billion dollars to Alberta's economy. After the break around the world in eight years, a Canadian man finishing an incredible journey. A Toronto man is returning home from a nearly decade-long mission to travel the world without using any motorized transportation. CTV's Adrian Gobriel spoke to the Globetrotter on his last leg of a life-changing escapade. Let's go rafting, Todd! Yeah! <laughs> there's the route less traveled, and then there's the path Marcus Pukonen has chosen to take for the last eight years. I'm on a crazy adventure around the planet without ever using motorized transport. No planes, trains, or automobiles, no motorboats or hitchhiking, not even a single elevator. The Canadian left the safe confines of his home in Toronto in July of 2015. Just about to cross uh, the St. Mary's River, and I'm going to head up into there. And he's been traversing the globe, using any and all forms of non-motorized transportation ever since. How long did your pogo stick? 10 kilometers. That's a lot of jumping and hopping. <laughs> it took five hours. To date, his journey has spanned more than 80,000 kilometers. Over 2,918 days, he's crossed the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans while traveling through 32 countries. We connected with the 40-year-old in Toronto's West End just days before he finishes the final leg of his journey. You know, I'm 20 kilometers from finishing it, and all I just feel is like an upwelling of emotion. After losing both of his parents, Buchanan began questioning his own mortality and his place on the planet. What would I do if I found out that I was going to die in two weeks? The answer to that question propelled him around the world. From coming face to face with a rhino in Nepal to taking a plunge in the vast Pacific. You're in the middle of the ocean by yourself on a boat. Did you find yourself going a little bit squirrely? I guess if you watch my videos, you might think I was going a bit squirrely. <laughs> Too often we think of things as being impossible and so often I, people told me what I was doing was impossible and there's no chance I could do it, but I always knew I could. Pukonen is donating proceeds from his epic adventure to a long list of nonprofits. He also hopes his journey can be an example of the positive impact each of us can have on the planet and humanity. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Incredible sense of adventure. And that's a snapshot of this Thursday. Heather Butts will be here tomorrow. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching and good night.